Hello again, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where in the world you are. Thank you very much for joining our session today. Um, so we'll be talking today about what digital financial service features might matter most to women uh, compared to men and, and why that is. We'll be uh, leveraging our research findings from Cote d'Ivoire and, and Kenya. So just to give you a run through of what today's session will look like, we'll try to, within the limits of a webinar, make it uh, uh, as interactive as possible. Uh, we'll start with uh, a short um, getting started with a presentation of who um, Caribou Digital is, so the consultancy that Savita and I uh, work uh, with, to then move into a bit of a definition uh, element uh, what do we really mean by DFS features, digital financial service features, and what are level one principles, uh, maybe uh, as a refresher, and then um, hope to, to get into a, a level of interactiveness uh, with you as participants, asking you which of the DFS features we, we speak about you think uh, matter most to women. We will then, um, hopefully, if everything works out well, we can see the responses to that and then move into uh, the deep dive into our research and what we have found effectively to be the DFS features that matter most to women and, and some recommendations. We'll also, and before um, jumping into features uh, themselves, we'll talk about uh, the overall trust framework that we've come come. Uh, to, to think about um, as carried with digital research uh, during our research. And finally, but not least, uh, move into a discussion time with another quiz, um, asking you about initiatives that you've heard about from DFS providers that have included um, uh, or addressed a woman uh, access and whether the recommendations that we come with, um, we come through with are applicable to the countries you work in. So um, hopefully uh, we can get some of your feedback and, and feed that into our question. Um, uh, just to finish, I'm Helen Smirtnik, I'm senior researcher and without further ado, I'll uh, hand over to Savita, my colleague, to, to talk us to the next few slides. Thank you very much. Thanks, Helen. Hi, everyone. Great to have you here. Um, just a, a quick caveat that um, I'm in New York and sometimes it's quite noisy, so if a siren goes past, I might mute myself um, for two seconds, but um, just, uh, just to say thank you for giving your time because I know there's a, there's a lot of things competing for our attention these days. Um, so yes, Caribou Digital, some of you may know us uh, already. We work with a number of private sector and public clients, um, <clears throat> including the World Bank, Committee R, D5 Australia. Australia, UNICEF, um, and many others. This research was specifically for the Gates Foundation. And uh, Helen, maybe if you could go to the next slide, I can explain a little bit more um, about the background of the research. Thank you. So, um, so the research was basically coming from the background that um, Gates Foundation, and again, some of you may already be familiar with the level one principles, but they're essentially um, more than 30 principles addressing digital financial services. So this can be anything from interop interoperability, open standards, um, irrevocability of payments, real-time notifications, KYC requirements, agent access. Um, so 30 features, all, um, it, there's more detail on the level one principles, um, level one project principles website. Um, but the one thing that um, they asked us to come in and do was to look at the gender impact of these principles. Were any of them having, uh, or could any of them have a greater impact on women as compared to men? So Helen and I are really interested in gender and digital technology uh, or uh, digital more broadly and specifically DFS. So this was a really interesting um, project for us to look at. Um, we won't be going into all 30 principles. We'll focus on the ones that we thought were the most relevant for the gender difference and the gender impact. So that's the background to the research, but um, please ask us any more questions if, if you've got any questions around the, the background. Um, yeah, ne next slide, Helen. So I think we'll be moving straight into the quiz. 
So um, if you could all go into your engage button, which should be on your screen on the right hand side, um, and you will see our question, which is if you could choose the top two DFS features that you think matter most to women compared to men. So just to reiterate those that uh, we've mentioned, um, cost and fees, how they impact women more than men, interoperability. Um, so um, I think you, you understand the terminology, but essentially how two accounts can, can work together. Uh, for example, just to, to make sure that everybody can, can relate, uh, M-Pesa and m are two different um, companies who have uh, two different digital financial services. They are interoperable and they allow end users as a result to both have an M-Pesa account and a savings account. And so what is the impact of um, seamless interoperability and does that matter more for women than for men? Real-time notifications, so confirmation messages that you receive once a payment is done. Irrevocability, the ability to cancel a payment after it went through. Uh, a USSD menu, um, I think that's straightforward. KYC requirements, the need for ID or documentation to access DFS or other. And on the other part, if given that the, the, the Slido does not enable us to see what other is, if you could just put in the chat box what you think are other DFS features that uh, we may not have thought about. We'll give you a few seconds. Thank you very much. This is really cool. It's nice to see it changing and um, yeah, the numbers are going up and down. Um, and it <laughs> looks like we could participate too, Helen. So I hope it's not cheating. Oh, I wish I could see, but I have the full screen. So I'm, I'm struggling. I'm, I'm relying on you. <laughs> I hope um, you found the engage button. It's on, um, it's on the feed loop screen. I can put it in the chat in here if, if you haven't found it or not in the chat rather, just in the Q&A. And in case others are also having the issue where they can't see that, then feel free just to type it in the Q&A section. Obviously, it's not a question, but it's just what you think are the top two features. Okay, looks like things are answers are settling down. Great. And then, okay, super. So, uh, can you? So, should I perhaps unshare my screen for you to share the screen with the results? Um, yeah, sure. Let me see if I can do that. I think everyone, um, not sure if everyone sees this, but let me see. Yeah, if you can just, um, oh, I can do it myself. Here we go. There we go. So, these are the ones that have come up. So top two DFS features, um, costs and fees, unsurprisingly, I think mm -hmm. 67%. Um, KYC requirements, actually, um, I think they they weren't as high initially. <laughs> and then I saw oh, it moved uh, shifting and changing, but then they rose. Interoperability and real-time notifications seems to be the same. Um, USSD is less, which is interesting because we'll talk about that as one of the mm -hmm. features. Um, other, we'd love to hear from those who put other in, in the Q&A section, because I think one of them, um, somebody just typed phone ownership is, is the other as well, which I think is really important. Irrevocability right. didn't come up so much, but I think it, it um, we'll be talking about it, um, especially from the merchant perspective. Um, yeah, Helen, any cool. thoughts on the quiz? Super, thank you very much for sharing that, uh, Savita. No worries. And uh, yeah, we'll keep those in mind as, as we move. Uh, as we move yeah, on. I think in line with the principles that we wanted to discuss as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, great. So. Savita. 
Yeah, so what did we do to um, find out what features did um, impact more on women than men, especially uh, because you know, this crosses over a lot into design research. So um, what, uh, what were the features that made a difference? Um, we started out with desk research, of course, just surveying um, both uh, the design kind of features of, of mobiles and, and gender, but also um, specifically on gender and DFS and all the findings that are uh, out there, a huge body of literature on that. Um, we also did expert interviews, trying to have a cross section of um, speaking to MNOs, DFS providers, think tanks, um, uh, you know, any, uh, all those who would be useful. Um, step two, um, we, then this is the one that um, Helen and um, I worked on, was the qualitative research. So uh, the field work with the end users, expert interviews. And this is, I think, the most relevant part that we looked at two countries, Cote d'Ivoire and Kenya. So when we um, have a discussion, We'd love to know whether you would find the same in the countries that you worked with in terms of the, D the actual DFS features. Um, step three, which was actually in parallel with step two, was quantitative research where we um, used caribou uh, data um, deploying in five markets. So we will go into more detail on what caribou data is, but it's, it's essentially kind of, kind of survey data. And there's one interesting finding from that. I mean, there, there are a lot of findings, but in the time that we've got, we just wanted to focus on one there. Um, Caribou data was deployed in um, three additional countries uh, other than Kenya and Cote d'Ivoire, which were Bangladesh, uh, Nigeria, and South Africa. Um, so we won't go into too much detail on those three countries just because we're, we have limited time, um, but happy to talk to you more about, uh, about any aspect of, um, um, of the findings. Um, so we did this with research partners in Kenya and Cote d'Ivoire, and if anyone is looking for research partners in those two countries, we really recommend these two teams. They were fantastic. And um, we also had a kind of um, uh, advisory group from the Global Center for Gender Equality at Stanford, which was really useful. And as you know, we work very closely with the Gates Foundation on how they how receptive they were to the findings and how it would impact on on uh, their policy going forward working so the the print the aim of the principles is that uh, they can be taken uh, and gates will work with dfs providers and mnos in country to um, test these principles out and see how much they apply so as uh, just to recap our research was are any of the individual level one project principles likely to affect women different, differently to men? And as a result, can any of the principles be improved in any way that benefits women more uh, than, it does, than they do currently? So what we'd like to go into is that, yes, some of them definitely impact on women more than men, um, which is always interesting when it comes to design. But then others are, they don't, affect women or men differently, but there are intersectional components like if there are rural inhabit inhabitants or older people or, or so on. So we'll go a little bit into that as well. So, yeah. Great, Over thank you very account. much, Davida. Um, great, so just to take a pause from, from the, the design and the, the technical uh, bit, um, what we found was important was to reiterate um, what we call a trust framework, i.e. before any uh, so financial service provider uh, starts uh, delving into developing a product or service is uh, thinking about trust. And, and why is that? Um, and, and this is, you know, our research has found that, but uh, a lot of uh, literature that you'll find and probably your own experiences also um, have shown that trust, um, as well as confidence and knowledge, um, which all go hand in hand, are critical for women when it comes to their financial lives and the financial services that they use. To use um, a, a, a quote from uh, FSD in Kenya, um, a, a DFS should cultivate social relationships and create upliftment. Uh, it shouldn't necessarily just be transactional based. So um, that is why we, we emphasize and want to just put back at the center 
of uh, when when any financial provider service provider is is thinking about developing a product is um, does this service or product bring a woman confidence in terms of usage um, can they trust it and what's the risk of not doing that um, I took a quote from uh, Vivienne that we interviewed in, in Yupougon, in the outskirts of, of Abidjan, Côte d'Ivoire, uh, which speaks to that, to the risks of not putting trust, uh, not, not including trust in, a, in the development of the DFS. She says, I don't want to leave money in my mobile money account. Once I receive it, I take it out. I feel like I'm losing money if I leave money in my mobile. Every time I want to do something with the money, it reduces and it certainly doesn't grow. It's not like the group savings or the bank. So with the caveat that Cote d'Ivoire and Kenya have quite different experiences, we have found that women, if they do not have trust in a digital financial service, will often often return back to cash or not even engage with, with, the, with the principles. So all of the principles that we speak about um, try to engage with this, this level of trust uh, how to make sure that a, a, a pro service is safe and reliable for women um, and do the payment features uh, enable uh, confidence. Uh, so um, that that is uh, an important point that we just wanted to emphasize and to keep in mind when we think about DFS um, design features. Yeah, so now we'll go into each of the features um, and how they how we felt that they impacted women differently again. Um, be interesting to hear what your thoughts are. Uh, the first one that comes up, and, and this is a, one of the level one principles, which is to make all mobile payment systems as interoperable as possible and with banks. Um, so uh, that's one principle. And then the second principle is to ensure real time notifications. So we put them both together because they're both kind of related. So when, let's say uh, Evelyn here who, um, Helen spoke to on the outskirts of Nairobi, um, she is not confident with transferring money from M-Pesa to equity um, through M-Pesa because sometimes it's hanging or she doesn't get a real-time notification saying that it's gone through. Um, in the case of Cote d'Ivoire, it's even more problematic because of network drops. Um, in Kenya, as you know, it's, it's much more um, steady and stable, but in Cote d'Ivoire, many people complain that sometimes the network just drops, they didn't know where their money was. So the interoperable issue was, was definitely a concern for women. The question of course is, is it more, does it impact women more than men? And there were a few issues there. One is that, um, and going back to Helen's trust framework, uh, women often felt that it was much easier for them just to withdraw money and from it, let's say from MPSA and take it physically and put it into the equity bank account. Um, that's not really what you know DFS is supposed to be about, but it's definitely how they they build their own trust. Um, the other question is if there is any issue, if the money is hanging or they don't know where it is, it means that they have to physically go and, and find out um, what the challenge is. And that means running from pillar to post to find out what's happening, which most women felt that they either didn't have time for or they didn't have the confidence for. So there was another woman in um, Cote d'Ivoire who said that she had to go with, um, I think it was her brother-in-law to the bank because she didn't feel confident that the bank would be um, respectful to her. So had to, um, and that, so A, she didn't have the time to do all this and B, as a woman, she didn't necessarily feel um, she had the power to, or didn't feel comfortable in the bureaucratic environment. So interoperability and real-time notifications clearly impact um, on women. Um, an example of this is, uh, thanks Helen, you, some of you may have heard, uh, read that Ugandan banks um, and mobile, the DFS environment face a major hacking scandal, I think something like um, three, uh, three million US dollars where um, mobile, um, uh, where money from banks was sent to mobile money accounts. Um, and so it's absolutely understandable that events like this make women, people generally, but definitely women, much more nervous about where their money is, especially hard-earned cash. Um, so going back to the, the level one principles, 
if we can do more about reassuring women where their money is, even if it's, you know, in process or, you know, where, where, if it's left the account, if it's in process, if it's reached the other account, I think that aspect of notifications is something that really comes through as important for women. The other question is around ethical design. And this is something that Helen and I are working a lot on, but the, the question of hidden fees. So um, the DFS um, principles for level one clearly state that fees should either be low or possibly zero, if, um, if that's possible. But then again, all fees charged to end users should be displayed clearly due to uh, before transaction execution. Um, but in, in reality, a lot of the women that we spoke to said that they just didn't know what they were paying fees for. And I think this relates to why uh, many women trust agents much more than um, doing uh, transactions on, on their phone because they're just not sure what's, um, what, what they're being charged for. And one of the experts we interviewed said that maybe this has been um, ignored or that there's been less emphasis on clarity on fees because a lot of mobile money agencies put a lot and more emphasis on fraud and fraud education because uh, that's certainly something that a lot of the women we spoke to were aware of um, but much less on what where the fees are going um, and so some of you may have um, encountered this term dark design or dark patterns that link is to a website which gives examples of, of dark patterns um, and it, you know, it's basically when you go to uh, unsubscribe, an example is you go to unsubscribe from a website, but actually, you know, that's the, that's the only box that's not checked. Everything else is checked. So you don't, you don't get to unsubscribe until you pay attention. Um, so similarly, a lot of the women we spoke to felt that they were being signed up to things without them knowing what was happening. Um, again, this is a question perhaps of literacy, of awareness, of confidence, trust, but definitely impacting more on women than men, the issue of, of um, hidden fees. And just to add to that, even when um, the fees are clear, where even when uh, women know that there is, for example, a cap to a free transfer, uh, they may not navigate their way around it. So one of the findings that we, we came across was that men were much more comfortable having um, navigating their way around um, um, having, let's say, five, making five free transfers to avoid the fee or the cost, whereas women sometimes were just not aware of it, so they ended up paying, paying the fee um, if they wanted to transfer more. So this whole idea about explaining fees and as well as making it explicit in design is something that came up quite a lot in our research. Yeah, and this relates to the one that um... Uh, the participants mentioned most costs and fees. Yeah. So. Yeah, definitely. Great. Thank you. Savita. Oh yeah, still, <laughs> still me. Sorry. Um, yes. So again, if the top two um, uh, lines or quotes are from the level one principles, so the principle of USSD uh, clearly. Um, uh, acknowledges that women use tend to use USSD on the whole much more than apps. Um, and uh, I forgot the name of the participant who was it, Tanvi, sorry, said phone ownership is, is important. Exactly. So USSD and having perhaps more lower end phones um, really uh, make a big difference on uh, you know, how women access um, DFS. Um, the second point about the user experience needing to be simple and intuitive is, again, very critical for women. Uh, when we looked at the quantitative data that we had mentioned, the, the caribou data results, we found that many more men, um, so 14% of men's DFS transactions tended to be over an app versus the 9% which were by women. This is across the five countries. So um, there's clearly much more confidence by men on the part of men for using an app to, to make a, a mobile money transaction than women. And you know, this is something that I'm sure you know, many, all of, many of you have come across, all these um, 
aspects such as um, Tanvi, as you mentioned, the type of phone. There's also the question around literacy um, and trusting uh, a USSD interface. Um, one interesting one is the confusion around whether an app would cost money or whether it would drain the battery. So um, this, this feeling that uh, the M-Pesa app, for example, costs money um, to use, uh, was very, uh, people were very confused around that. And then also, uh, uh, it's not just USSD, but also getting used to a particular string or syntax in USSD, which came across a lot more in Cote d'Ivoire than in Kenya for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, the participants in Cote d'Ivoire were much less used to mobile money as compared to Kenya, which, which we know, but also that uh, there is a variety of providers in Cote d'Ivoire, so the syntax might vary a little bit. So, so the women we spoke to said if they felt comfortable using a particular string, they would stick to that. Um, so that, that comfort and reassurance was, was really important for them. Um, all, all this to say that it was in alignment with the with the level one principle that we shouldn't forget DFS and the rush to building for apps. Yeah. And just one, one last thing, maybe on, on the string to, to be explicit about the fact that in Cote d'Ivoire right now, unlike in Kenya, um, they don't have the USSD embedded menu in the phone, which makes it so much uh, easier to go through the steps. Um, you had to remember uh, you know, a star 126 hash and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So uh, even I can't, can't remember, I, I can't remember it right now, but complex figures, uh, which also speaks to the, you know, to the, this other aspect of uh, embedding menus within, within phones versus uh, very long short codes. Um, okay. It's an interesting aspect. Thanks very much. Great. Um, I apologize for the very uh, wordy slide. Um, we, we spoke about irrevocability. This is one of uh, the important uh, level one principles that we see impact women more than men. Um, within irrevocability, we, we need to make a distinction between, uh, well, to, to kind of break it down a bit. Uh, there are two aspects and two, two elements. One is uh, canceling a payment before it goes through, before you hit send and revoking a payment, which happens once uh, you pushed on the send button and, and therefore the money has uh, left your, your account. Um, the cancelling feature uh, has um, been a, quite a positive, a very strongly positive feature for women in particular, as well as men, but women were more vocal about it. The revoking feature is, is much um, more of a uh, varying scenarios and experiences. So just uh, on the cancelling feature. So we saw in both countries that the ability to cancel a payment before it goes through, um, you know, through messages that ask you to confirm a few times or by giving you uh, a few seconds. Uh, in Kenya, uh, you are given 25 seconds uh, to cancel a payment before it goes through. So both those aspects uh, were extremely helpful and had value for women that enabled them to trust the service and feel like they could actually go ahead and um, make a transactions on their own, given that they knew that, that they had that time to cancel if they made a mistake when typing a number, for instance. Um, Evelyn, uh, who, who we saw a bit earlier uh, in front of her stall uh, in, in the outskirts of Nairobi, says that uh, when you are in a hurry and have many customers buying, this is a very, very strongly a case of being a merchant, uh, you may send the money back to the wrong person. You need something that forces you to look and before you press send. So that aspect of canceling a payment, um, the cancellation of a payment feature is, is critical uh, for, for both men and women, surely, uh, but also has, has led women to more confidence in the usage of, of DFS. On the other hand, when it comes to revoking a payment once it's made, um, that is uh, possible, uh, but it's neither seamless nor guaranteed. And we had a very wide range of experiences from women having more or less success. Uh, it turns out that looking at our quantitative 
uh, data from, from caribou data again, uh, they, they noted that uh, men uh, were more likely than women to be successful in making reversals um, of, of payments. So imagine once your payment has gone through, actually, don't, don't imagine, I will just uh, uh, share a quote um, from, from Helen, who's a Shusha seller, that gives you an idea of what happens when you try to make, when you try to revoke a payment. So you, you finish with your customer and you find that they reverse the money. Um, and this I'll talk a bit, but um, essentially this person uh, is a shoe seller and uh, has a customer who's paid her and then left her stand and reversed the money. She was maybe serving another customer, so she didn't see it immediately, but then she gets a notification that the, the money has been reversed. She says, on calling customer care, they ask a lot of questions and you have to go to the agent. You realize then that the customer has withdrawn the money and it is too late. So as a result, Helen has reverted back to cash. Um, this is an example of what kind of steps one has to go through when revoking. Sometimes it's easier. Um, sometimes you will just call the number that you erroneously send the money to and in good faith they will send it back. Um, there's always a, a level fee that's involved, but it can be much, much more complex and we found that women um, sometimes go through a lot of uh, complicated steps um, to, to send back the money or um, to get the money back. Um, one other aspect which Helen speaks about here is that not only is it complicated, um, but as we can see, sometimes revoking payments has led to fraud uh, for merchants in particular who find themselves selling goods, thinking that the money is in their wallet and their mobile money wallet, and all of a sudden it's not there and they can't do anything about it. And, and it goes back to uh, the risk that this entails when um, you know, the revoking feature is not, is not seamless, is that uh, customers go back to, to cash. And as we know for financial service providers, um, that, that's a, losing customers uh, to cash is, is not insignificant. Um, the same way that, as, as Savita and as I mentioned earlier, when you don't, uh, you withdraw your money immediately as soon as you get it in your phone, uh, means that the money is not staying in the as a mobile money, as digital money, and that's um, significant losses for for the provider. So, in terms of revoking features, uh, the level one principles actually speak about irrevocability, so they do not encourage um, enabling these revoking features. But if they were to go ahead, there's uh, certainly a need for standards and processes on how to deal efficiently with return requests, in particular, as we can see how much they impact women who are less successful as, at, at re reversing and getting their money back. KYC requirements. Uh, so we, I think that came as a second, uh, the second uh, DFS feature that may impact women most. Um, and, and indeed, it, it is one. Um, so, you know, two, two aspects that uh, uh, you probably know about very much. So l levels of ID coverage for women uh, are less. Um, a figure here uh, that um, our GSMA colleagues um, have mentioned is in low income countries, over 45% of women do not own an official proof of ID. And not only that, but they're also more likely to rely on other account and that others is often husbands um, or fathers. In addition to that low level of ID coverage, there's also a low level of collateral for women who often, and mind you in the demographics that we were interviewing, so in, in more vulnerable communities, uh, these, these demogra and the, within these demographics, women will have um, smaller incomes and as a result may not have as easy access to collateral um, than a woman would sorry than a man would have uh, to be able for instance to to get a loan so they they would um, if I take the words of Julia she says that with mobile money it's easier than with a bank because they don't ask for big collateral and as a result it's, it's beneficial to um, to us this is Julia in in the outskirts of, of Nairobi so two aspects that speak to uh, the limitations and the impact that uh, ID requirements and collab, you know, documentation by and large requirements have on, on women's access and, and willingness to use DFS services. On the other hand, there it's important to note that 
um, and, and interesting to, to see that when uh, ID, uh, ID requirements do provide a level of, um, do inspire trust um, when it comes to, to women mentioned it often as if an agent asked for an ID, then they felt like this was a, an official transaction. So um, there is a, a level of balance in terms of what ID requirements uh, should be. And, and finally, but not least, um, standards uh, when it comes to ID requirements aren't always the same and that, ha that can have quite a, 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 a negative impact on the overall experience of using DFS services. Just to, to illustrate this in Côte d'Ivoire, what we saw is um, one agent would say to his client, you don't have to use, you don't have to show me your ID just to be able to have more clients and have a competitive advantage over an agent that would ask for it. So standards not being clear made the whole situation confusing for a lot of the women we interviewed who didn't know whether they needed ID or not. Um, so so that, that also has a, an impact. So in terms of our recommendation as a, as a result um, from, from this research, we found that encouraging tiered KYC products, which mean that a woman may not need an ID for um, a very basic transaction for, let's say, a very small deposit or a very small withdrawal. Um, when it comes to more um, sophisticated um, financial services, then ID most likely will be required. But to allow, um, enable a staggered access uh, to, to DFS services uh, seems as, as a way of enabling them to, to encouraging them to use a service and then giving them a sense of control over their finance, not having to rely on their husbands or their family. And finally, when ID is required, making sure that uh, there are standardized, there are standards to avoid the, the distortions that happen in the market like in Côte d'Ivoire. And finally, uh, one point that uh, we, we wanted to make um, was that uh, gender is, is critical um, for, as, as we can see, um, uh, you know, it, it's an important element that DFS providers need to take into account when they develop products and services, but it's not only about gender. Um, here, um, an MPSI agent, um, who, mind you, was, was a male MPSI agent, but who a, a, a statement that resonated quite quite a lot with the other respondents we spoke with said, I don't think I see a gender difference. The big difference, I think the age factor comes in, and I'm sorry, I can't read my whole, my whole quote, um, but he speaks about a young guy who's conscious of costs versus an old person who will just want to send money. The young guy, um, him or her, will try to compare charges to see if he can save something. Uh, I have seen that trend, and that speaks about what Savita was saying earlier about um, you know, uh, end users that decide to do staggered payments in small amounts to avoid uh, paying fees. And that has been quite common in, with men more than women, to be, to be honest. Um, so, so when we do see, when we do go to to the, the the gender difference, it certainly exists, but there's also income and age to take into account. We've saw, seen from our, quanti our quantitative information that actually in Kenya, which is a more mature market, um, women and men in certain demographics that are often higher income have similar transaction profiles, so they use DFS services as often and for similar amounts. So again, not always about gender. When you see uh, income uh, starts playing a role, notably uh, uh, an interesting data point from Caribou data was when you're looking at airtime data top up for higher income groups, uh, top up only represented 25% of their transactions on uh, digital payment platforms. Whereas for lower income groups, it was 60 to 65%. So much less use of peer-to-peer uh, -peer or peer-to-business kind of services. Age is also uh, an element to take into account. Uh, men, sorry, younger uh, generations are more likely to use more uh, technologically savvy products such as loans compared to older groups. Um, so that's also an element to take into account to not leave out the older generations when, when developing uh, products and services in the financial sector. Savita, I hand over to you. 
Yeah, and just to just to add that obviously all our research was pre-COVID. Um, so before the mobile phone um, and DFS providers lifted fees in many of the countries, which is why you know we talk about fees, but um, but but it would be interesting to see how behavior may have changed. And again, mm -hmm. I think uh, many of you might have insights on that. Um, but quiz two, and from quiz two, we're going to open it up to discussions and questions, which is. Um, where we'd like to hear your insights because you know you're all experts in this field um, as well. So uh, the first question, it's a two-part quiz. One is, um, have have you come across similar research which looks at the gender difference in um, DFS design? Um, so do you know of any initiatives that providers who could include MNOs or you know others have addressed? Uh, these design features in some way. So is it, for example, have they am uh, amended their, the ways that notifications are, are sent to address privacy for women? That could be an example. Or do they make um, fees much clearer? Some of these may not be gender specific, of course, because they may not know if the end user is a, a man or a woman, but it may, they may come from concerns that women that have come from women. So that's the first question. Do you have any initiative? Do you know of any initiatives? And uh, would you be able to share them? Because we, we'd love to hear about how they, this has been addressed. And secondly, um, in the recommendations that we talk about, um, do you think these apply to the countries that you work in or have experience in? Um, or, you know, are we uh, making too much of the gender difference? Um, so either way, we'd, we'd just be interested to hear about your experiences um, and even you know, maybe contradictory findings to the ones that we've got because um, gender is not homogenous. Um, so yeah, if you could answer questions one and two. So I think on your screen, if you go to the Engage tab, you've got um, question one up first. So uh, it's a free text answer. Um, if you can just type it in and then we can um, call out and discuss, um, discuss that question and answer. Um, so Abby, I think you're going to leave up question one for a while, right? Or oh, oh, it's because I haven't typed my answer in. Okay, let me type in an answer. So I like the 25 second rule for MPESA because I think that's helped women. I mean, I'm sure, I think it's probably helped men and women, but the women brought it up. Okay, and then the next question comes up straight after that, okay. Okay, so I have and answered both the questions. Just waiting for all the answers to come in. Shren, well, you want to do the same thing where you share your screen for the answers and, and moving into the Q&A or do you want to keep the quiz questions up? Um, I can't see the answers right now. I don't know okay. whether because they're free text, but I can read them out as they come in. Okay. Um, Whatever makes yeah. more sense. Yeah. Yeah. I guess in this case, um, there's not nothing visual there, so perhaps. Right. You know, yeah. yeah. Um, but there are some questions in the um, chat in the slide in the feed loop chat as well as the zoom chat so I didn't realize you could see questions here so let me uh, let's answer these Helen sure. um, so Lynn has made the point that I think I hope Lynn we've captured this correctly um, the issue of women having the type of phone that can make full use of DFS apps is a challenge as often they don't have smartphones. Yes, definitely. Um, so which is why we highly recommend, and I think this is where a lot of providers are making the mistake, 
for immediately jumping to uh, design apps rather than thinking about uh, lower end phones and DFS um, or for, on USSD. Um, Helen, I don't know any research. Sorry, go. Yeah, on. just just from 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 experience. I mean, I, I, in both, I'm, I'm not sure I I am answering this properly, Lynn's question, but um, uh, you know, uh, the most basic phone um, can can do a, a financial transaction. However, it's you know the most basic ones. Um, once it move, you know, if you move into to loan products and saving products, you can still do them through very basic um, feature phones, uh, you know, as, as they call them, versus smartphones. Um, the the need for an app is is not is not necessary um, for for those kind of services um, at least. Um, so yeah, it's just something to to keep in mind. Uh, certainly, not everybody has a smartphone, and I think uh, you know mobile operators do know that they somehow you find a lot of mobile operators are trying to encourage customers to move to the apps and haven't yet uh, cracked the the mysterious uh, or <laughs> however you want to call it but they haven't yet found a solution to to make that transition from uh, from ussd to to app um, and i think one of the big reasons is because yeah smartphone usage is less um, so as a result, keeping keeping the USSD option is is, is critical, uh, but it's it's very much there. Yeah, definitely. So um, so one thing I I think what's happening is maybe the second quiz didn't quite work. So we have uh, we oh, no. have the Q and A in the chat, but also okay. if you would like to um, uh, pick up on any point or ask any question or contribute. Yeah. So we can leave that uh, quiz two up on the screen. So if you want to answer any of those questions, um, just raise your hand and then we can, we can have you talk. Um, again, it would be great to hear your experiences and, and thoughts. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, uh, let me answer some of, or address some of the other points. So uh, Astrid, Astrid uh, I hope I'm pronouncing mm -hmm. it right, your question was on how the younger generation can be un enrolled as coaches to support the older generation mm -hmm. to incentivize uptake. That's a, that's a really good point. It's a nice, nice question, yeah. Yeah, and just to say, I mean, that's of course not just for us. If anybody else has ideas, please pitch in. Yeah, but, um, I think on that point, um, it, it reminds me of a, a younger woman we interviewed, or she, she was around in her 30s. Actually, there are two women we interviewed um, in Kenya, both, uh, who, who mentioned that, that the particular need uh, for peer-to-peer uh, -peer, um, sharing of information. Uh, one woman said, uh, I, oh, the older generation would much rather uh, learn about experiences of their peers versus uh, receive an SMS that tell them about a certain uh, new um, DFS, so, you know, digital financial service. Um, so that that relates quite well. And then if you add to that the ability for younger people to come and share their experiences, um, I, I do think that the only thing about that to consider is, um, you know, the the woman, the older woman tend to have the same issue. So, you know, from one older woman to another, uh, from our their, their focus group discussions we had, they tend to have the same issues, whereas the younger generation may not always relate uh, to, you know, the maybe more basic issues in terms of using the phone. Um, so that's the only thing to, to consider when having younger generations inform uh, older generations. Not to say that it's, it's not possible, but it's just this kind of understanding kind of how to, to to create that dialogue, uh, but certainly peer-to-peer -peer versus just sending an SMS or seeing an advertisement on on the television or hearing an advertisement on the radio is much much stronger. Going back to trust. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, the Finequity mailing list, which is fantastic, they had a really interesting discussion on different DFS features and, and gender and. And what, I remember one of the participants wrote something very um, poignant about how uh, he, when he was doing research, he, one woman had written her um, passcode on the on the walls of the, the place where she was living. 
Um, but at the same time, I don't, I, the, he, he was worried, he as the researcher was worried about how older uh, women particularly were trusting the younger members of their family too much. And in some cases being conned out of their money, um, mm. even though there were small amounts. So I think there is also the question of, um, again, trust. I mean, yes, you, there is a trust you should be able to trust your family members, but also the awareness that it is your money. I mean, it's it's the same as giving somebody your um, uh, the pin for your bank card, I guess. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, how do you deal with those issues? Uh, I think is is important. I don't know if any others have questions or thoughts or anything that was particularly interesting from the research or you think you'd like us to focus on more for next time or something that felt completely wrong <laughs> uh, and yeah maybe very obvious <laughs> well the fact is that uh, doing this research was um, uh, could seem obvious in the first place um, but obviously you know uh, the Gates Foundation felt the need to to make sure that the features that had been developed in the first place were effectively taking into account women's experiences. So it often feels like common sense, but then is not always taken into account. I, it's very fascinating to see how, you know, the findings we had according to to the the experiences of women compared to men. Yeah, definitely. Um, Helen, Astrid had a follow up question, which I think is really interesting, and. Um, we can we can make it the um, last one if you like because it's um, we can stop at giving folks five minutes. But um, it's a, a question of um, youth ambassador. Is there a possibility of having a, a the phrasing of um, using the phrase youth ambassador um, as a kind of official um, uh, connector? So as to the question is, does the private sector or a particular service provider in the private sector use the youth actively in their strategy to use reach more clients or increase the number of products sold per customer. So having someone who perhaps is is in that role of the youth ambassador. Um, it's not something that I've heard of, but I can definitely see that um, becoming, I can definitely see scope for that. Um, but then I, I also wonder, you know, it would need a fair amount of, again, trust and um, interpersonal skills on the, on the, um, on, what's the word, um, on the part of the ambassador, just because of having patience. And I think whenever it comes to technology, there's always a, a generational difference. <laughs> Did you come across any anyone? No, I haven't. And it just makes me think about a point that we didn't address as much in this presentation, but that's uh, extremely important and again relates to the, the, the trust framework um, is agents. Uh, yeah. the, the importance of having um, you know, access to agents um, and agents that one can trust. So, you know, for, for agents to be at close proximity for people. And, and again, one of the reasons why MPESA is so, so popular and successful is because agents are everywhere. And that uh, as they, as to quote a, a respondent that we interviewed, uh, everywhere it's green because Safaricom MPESA is, is a green logo. Um, and uh, there was a, some, some questions around what is the role of agents um, effectively, can they play this ambassador role? Um, and there is um, there are some you know different uh, responses to to whether or not that is their role, and some will take take it as as their role to inform older generation. But what often happens is an older woman, in particular, woman will go to an agent and give the phone and just ask for the agent to do the whole transaction. And that's something that agents don't always feel comfortable doing. Uh, but some of them feel that that's you know they they are willing to to do so. So it's kind of on a case by case. But it just it just made me think. It's a bit of a side note, but yeah. it made me think about the role of agents um, and, and the you know what how they help in you know increasing knowledge and information of particularly women and older women. Yeah, and the trust factor again, like you said, some 
especially in Cote d'Ivoire, somebody might actually travel further to go to an agent that they trust. That's right, yeah, less proximity to agents in Cote d'Ivoire. Yeah, okay. I think we should wrap up because it's, uh, it's been an intense couple of days for participants and uh, the, yeah. I know there are more sessions that you'd like to get to. Um, thank you so much for joining us, all of you. And uh, in the um, feed loop chat, I've just put uh, our email addresses if you'd like to contact us for any more questions or again, insights and Helenia, thank you for having that here as well. Um, so yeah, please do, we'd love to again, know if there's anything we're missing, if there are other gender features, gender issues that we, we should be talking about, um, our doors are open. So yes, please, please uh, let us know if you've got any questions. Anything your side, Helen? No, no, just thank you very much for joining. Yeah, thank you. Really appreciate you giving your time. And have a great day. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.